Well, we definitely have a marriage crisis on our hands these days, from Gen Z's postponing marriage to uh, definitional marriage, same-sex marriage, all in question in our society. Today, we're going to be talking about how we can use marriage to point to the truth of Christianity on today's episode of Unapologetic, where we defend truth without compromise. With Dr. Bobby Conway, the One Minute Apologist, we're joined by his amazing wife, Heather Conway, and I'm your host, Tim Hall. Well, guys, there is definitely some things going on in our culture when it comes to marriage that we have to address. I mentioned some things at the top of this episode where the whole idea of marriage has been in flux, it seems like, for a while. But since 2015, when the Obergefell decision came down, things got really, really, really rocky. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the questions that a lot of people are asking is, really, what is marriage? What's the foundation of it? And then what does it actually look like? What does marriage look like? Can it look different than it has in the past? Or should it always look like it has, you know, 50, 100 years ago? We can admit, and we'll get to this later on, that there's models of biblical marriage that seem a bit odd. Are those prescriptive? (laughs) Is that something that we should be doing, right? So we'll get to some of those. But uh, Bobby, just kind of fill out some of this conversation for us about what actually marriage is. Well, you're right to point out in the introduction of today's show that we have a crisis on our hands. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have a marriage crisis. Uh, We have a definitions that have become too broad that basically you lose the definition altogether. Yeah. Uh, you have a culture that we live in now where same-sex marriage is celebrated. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have polyamorous relationships and states that are sanctioning that now, and people saying the way of the future is going to be polygamous marriage. You've got situations with the Gen Z, the emerging generation, where they're getting married later and later. Uh, Many people are wanting uh, the idea of sex without responsibility, so they don't want to have to be committed. So some people are looking at this marriage and the institution of marriage as just a taboo to society Mm -hmm. and not even worth wrestling over. If you truly love somebody, just be connected. But then you're here as a Christian, and I am as well, and we're like, well, what's our responsibility in this, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the culture can have their own ideas about marriage, but God has his own idea for what a marriage looks like in the scripture. And so what the church has to be careful is to not placate the culture. So we have to hold fast our apologetic. We have to give a defense for why it is that we believe the Bible teaches a monogamous marriage between a husband and a wife. And we meet that in Genesis chapter 1, that were created in his image, verse 26 and 27, and that God brought the two together to be one flesh. Uh, That is repeated again uh, in Matthew 19, where Jesus refers back to Genesis chapter 1, right. uh, we see God's pattern for marriage in 1 Peter chapter 3 and Ephesians yep. chapter 5. Uh, we can see uh, the Song of Solomon for what this looks like. Uh, yet the Bible <laughs> has some problem passages along the way that we could talk about as well. Nevertheless, when you consider 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, that the elders to be a husband of one wife, that he's not to be involved in a polygamous relationship. And so basically, we are at this place as Christians where historically we've taught that marriage is between a husband and a wife Yeah. and before God. Now we have to ask ourselves, are we going to hold fast to that? Do we believe that's biblical? Or are we going to just make the Bible fit the culture of our day. Well, I I will say to our audience that we will cover some adult topics, some things of a sensitive nature in this episode. So if you have young ones in the car with you as you're listening to this, uh, you may want to pause it and listen at a later time. Uh, That also goes for if you're checking us out on YouTube. And while I'm speaking of the YouTube channel, you can head on over to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash one minute apologist. You can rewatch this video. You can watch other episodes of the Unapologetic Show. While you're there, you can go ahead and hit the like 
button on this video, subscribe and click the notification bell so you're notified whenever we publish a new video or new resource. So we're gonna cover uh, as many things as we can when it comes to marriage and this idea of marriage as an apologetic as Bobby kind of laid out as we can in the limited amount of time that we have. Again, this is a very broad and deep subject and we can go a number of different directions with that. But even Bobby, you mentioned kind of this model of marriage that was laid out in Genesis, but we know shortly after that, it goes awry pretty quickly. Uh, you know, we have stories of, you know, Abraham, uh, you know, Abraham and Sarah and the, you know, promise of Isaac and he's trying to move things along a little bit and uh, it kind of goes outside the, the, the marriage, um, the marriage bed, if you will. So how are we, are, and that's just one example of, of many. So how are we to uh, even think about some of these things and we can look back at the Bible and just say, man, marriage seems like it was all over the place, particularly in the Old Testament. How can we even use the Bible to justify uh, marriage between a man and a woman? Well, the Bible uh, accurately records what's going on and not everything that the Bible reports does it approve of? <laughs> and we have to remember point. that in Genesis, you're correct that we get this, you know, foundation for what marriage is to look like. And then you see Abraham and things are just kind of wheels off. But we need to remember that Moses is given, uh, you know, the book of Genesis story, uh, it is believed. And so what happens is, is we're learning about how it was at the beginning with Adam and Eve, that they clearly understood God's blueprints for marriage. Yeah. But east of Eden, what ends up happening, uh, we know time goes on and we end up even going forward. You come to Babel, the Tower of Babel's destroyed, uh, the nations are spread out, and people start their own civilizations. And they ended up believing in their own gods. So they got God wrong, they got marriage wrong, uh, they got <laughs> relationships wrong. Right. Uh, and uh, so that it shouldn't surprise us in a world east of Eden that we have this. So when the Bible's recording some of the polygamous relationships going on, it's not recording it from a stance of approval. It's just God's meeting them in their culture of debauchery. And what he's doing is he's trying to move them toward the biblical ideal. In fact, we are even warned in the scripture, uh, Solomon's warned, in the day you take of many uh, women, that will be your downfall. Yeah. And that was Solomon's downfall. Yeah. It was David's downfall. So uh, the nice thing is... Is, is there are people that were engaged in polygamous relationships and God still used them. You know what? God still uses us in spite of ourselves as well, yeah. uh, too. And we need to amen remember, to that. amen to that. And they didn't have 66 books of the Bible to turn to. Right. Uh, you know, you're talking, they had a, a word from God here and there, and they're just kind of doing the best to follow the moral law with from in, uh, from within. It, you know, it's not until you really get the law out in the wilderness, uh, which is about 1500 BC. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have many years preceding that where it's kind of wheels off and confusing. So yeah. all that to say, I think there's great explanations that we can give, but it's going to require doing a little history, a little uh, sociology, and an understanding of how God works with people through progressive uh, revelation of and, himself. And that was fantastic, and you did an excellent job. If anyone has questions or wants to comment on that, you can do so in the comment section underneath this video. I want to turn to a little bit of a lighter note and bring Heather in here. Heather, <laughs> take us to the moment. Um, if you can remember as best you can. When she first saw me? No, I, well, I was going to do one step beyond that. Take us to the still moment my heart. Where, where, you, where you first thought, if he asked me to marry him, I would say yes. Paint oh. us that picture uh, oh. a little bit. Mm. You know, I don't even know that. Yeah, Tim, revealing, good one. Revealing secrets here on Unapologetic. Well, okay, yeah. so I don't, I don't remember that particular moment, but I Come do on. remember... Us being in Beverly Hills on Rodeo Drive, we were sightseeing because I was a country girl, spending my summer from Arkansas in California, and I was making him take me to all these wonderful places Sweet. in California. Yeah. So we happened to be on Rodeo Drive, and you know, Bobby's, our marriage is, it's it's a hard marriage. We have to work at it. And even when we were dating, we conflicted a lot. Mm -hmm. But I remember being on Rodeo Drive, we had gotten in an argument and I was just like, not happy. But I remember looking at you, and I've told you this story going, but I love him. You know, I, I do. Mm -hmm. I love him. I think he's my person. So maybe that's kind of the answer yeah. to your question. No, that's a, that's a good um, question. So, that's a good you know, answer. 
Yeah, that's that's how it was for me. I am your person. You are my person. Yeah. <laughs> You're my my wonderful flawed person, and I'm yeah. your wonderful flawed person. That's exactly. Well, right. I, I I think that that's interesting that that came in a moment of conflict, right. not necessarily in a moment yeah, of bliss. Is, it wasn't exactly. in a moment of bliss that you were saying, "Man, I just I'll be with this right. person forever because this is such a great moment." But that it was in a moment of opposition where you're like, even in this moment of opposition. I, I can still, yes. you know, see myself with this person forever because they're my person. Bobby, do you have a similar <laughs> moment where you were like <laughs> picking out the ring or headed to pick out the ring or, or asking asking her dad for permission or whatnot? Well, I wouldn't have minded marrying her the first time I saw her at 5223 Nelbrook Drive nope. where her <laughs> parents lived. Uh, I actually met her. Uh, I never went on blind dates and I was on a blind date. Uh, it was the only blind date I ever had. With someone and else. With someone else. And I was wishing I wasn't on a blind date because when I saw her, she was with her boyfriend. And I thought, man, uh, I wish I was taking her out because we just hit it off. We were both yeah. new Christians. We were talking and engaging. And uh, her and her boyfriend ended up breaking up not long after that. And we started dating. Uh, but I was <laughs> definitely drawn um, to her early on. But it's true. I, I wasn't equipped to... Um, to know how to relate, like th- just the way I grew up with conflict, it was a mess. And then all the drugs and the alcohol and promiscuity, I met her when I was six months clean. She'd go to AA meetings with me, <laughs> but I had uh, so much to grow uh, in as it relates to knowing what it means to take care of a woman, what it means to be responsible. I mean, literally, Tim, uh, I went to go get a job at Chili's and I didn't go in to take the test because I was feared I wouldn't get the the menu memorized. Mm. And I came back uh, to her parents' house to see her. And she was really concerned by that. She's like, you know, I need to know that if we're going to do life together, that that you can work. But I was so discouraged uh, at that stage of my life, Mm -hmm. very, very insecure. And just really little did we know, both of our backgrounds would contribute to so much work Mm -hmm. that we would have. And, um, you know, there's just tough seasons in marriage. But one thing that I, that I love about my wife and that I've told her many times is we have forgiven each other so many times and we're still here. And, mm. you know, we have like, so sometimes you get these people, they just got this amazing marriage, but it, it's really easy yeah. and they don't have to forgive each other a lot. But my hat really does go off to those couples who are in mm-hmm. the ring a lot and it's not easy and they bring a lot of trauma and pain in. And yet you fast forward 10, 20, 30, 40 years and they are still in the ring together yeah. and they have forgiven each other over and over and over again. Heather and I can truly say if it wasn't for the gospel, uh, we wouldn't have what we yes. have. Yes. And uh, it is because of the gospel that keeps us trying to fight for this thing we're talking about, the apologetics of marriage, yeah. defending it. I mean, because at the end of the day, we heard this early on, and I think it really served us well in our marriage, is that love is a decision. It's not a feeling. Yeah. And, you know, we did bring a lot of baggage into our marriage. You know, we did. We, we didn't grow up in Christian homes. We had all the things. But when you realize, you know what, I don't have to wake up and feel goo-goo eyes over my spouse every day. Yeah. It's a decision that I am making. And and marriage is hard work. It takes grit. It takes resilience. It takes forgiveness. It takes sacrifice. And, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. But I think that is how we set ourselves apart as Christians, because the world says, hey, you know, you do you, boo, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, if it's not working yeah. for you, you, you just move on. It's okay. Yeah. Find you another. You quit when you want to quit. But I think when you belong to the Lord, you, you realize you, you've said yes to a covenant and you've said yes to hard times, sickness and in health. And I think that has served us well. And the love is a decision because agape being, you know, a, a verb, but it doesn't mean that, that love, that feelings is not a part of love. Of right. course. But you just don't, you just don't lock in on that only. I mean, it can be tough if you never have any feelings. Right. Um, you know, but I think feelings follow doing the right things. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I get completely selfish and blinded and don't think about my wife's needs, she's not going to feel a lot of love for me. But we can bounce back, and those feelings can also come by doing the right thing. And that whole honeymoon idea, like there's a reason I think that you have the midlife crisis. People feel like they've got to know each other. They feel yeah. like they've conquered each other. There's something fun about falling in love. Like I loved falling in love with yeah. Heather. It's like, you know, what are, what are some of the makeup of that? Like, oh, I can't wait to see each other. You're really interested. You want to ask a bunch of questions. You're curious about the other totally. person. And mm-hmm. all that is really exciting. And some of that does go away where you have to be more creative about how do you not get bored? Like you feel like you know each other. So how do you keep 
keep mm -hmm. interesting, keep yourselves interesting to one another? Yeah. How do you look forward to being with one another? So what people do is they think, oh, they want to fall in love again because that was fun, but they don't realize that you're going to go through the same process. You're going to get yeah. to know that person. You're not going to feel like you're, you, you, all that stuff wears out and the honeymoon season gets <laughs> right. away. And so I want something more than just a honeymoon. I want the real deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say, I, I think, Again, and my wife's not here, so I won't share too much. Um, <laughs> Give us all the goods, yeah, right. Tim. <laughs> so I, I think one, I, the, the key moment for me was um, being at my wife's sister's wedding, which was um, about a year before we got married. Mm. So uh, that was kind of one of the things where just, you know, we were hanging out. It was kind of that time, that, that blissful time. And I was just like, yeah, I, I think I could spend the rest of my life with this person. And there was several more months before I actually proposed. And then again, like a, a, a year from that time when we actually uh, got married. But I remember one thing that the pastor that was marrying us, who's a great friend of ours, mentor of mine, uh, he said, today begins the day that you start the game of trying to outserve one another. Mm -hmm. So I'd like you guys to talk about what what a marriage rooted in serving one another mm -hmm. looks like because the model of the gospel is that of Jesus serving us, coming to die for us. And so That's we can good. use some of that as kind of a, um, a launching pad. And I do want to get to, at the end, um, just talking a little bit about people that find themselves being divorced. And what, you know, can we give them hope or mm. what, what, you know, again, try not to, to shame and say, man, I didn't do it right. Or I am a Christian. I do believe in the gospel, um, but this didn't work out. I now have divorce papers or I'm single or whatnot. And so I want to talk a little bit about where people might find themselves in that. But I want to start mm -hmm. with the idea of service and what that, what that mm. looks like for the two of you in your marriage. Well, yeah. I would say that that was something that was a real problem in our marriage. And it, uh, because I was, you know, very selfish uh, for most of the marriage, I can still slip into selfishness. Mm -hmm. Um, but Heather is a great servant. She's stood by my side, been very supportive of me with my studies through the years. I mean, keep in mind, here's a woman who stood by me through, uh, my Bible college, a four year master's degree. <laughs> uh, it, my first doctor, it took four years. And then my second one just took me seven or eight years to finish up. Um, you know, church plants, uh, all that. Uh, but I have an addictive personality. So when I got saved, um, I kind of got freed from the alcohol eventually. Yeah. But I threw my addict brain into studies. And that would detach me very much so at times in our marriage. And I don't like that. Yeah. Um, I don't like that it detached me as a dad either at times. Um, in fact, we ended up in counseling many years ago, and the counselor said, you know, Bobby, you're detached. And I really didn't even know what that meant. Mm. I was so detached that I didn't even know what detached meant. Um, but I don't feel detached anymore. I feel more integrated. I feel yeah. like I understand what that means. And so service, um, it is the model that you see in like in Ephesians 5 um, that, you know, a man's going to leave his mother and father hearkening back to Genesis. But it says, verse 32 of Ephesians 5, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And that is the picture of what marriage is to be, that Christ as the head of the church, husband, the head of the home, as the church submits to the um, Christ, the wife submits to the husband, and th the language submission can just create like a uh, for yeah. people. But it, mm -hmm. but the true matter of the fact is, is Christ is the one who ultimately submitted dying, yeah. and mm -hmm. the husband's the one who's to ultimately submit by dying. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not like there's you know, but there's that dance that you have together, and that can be a real model in our community. It becomes a witness for people to see when we stand by each other's side and mm. when we serve each other. I gave my wife when I graduated from Dallas Seminary, it was a little statue of Jesus cleaning the disciples' feet because that's what mm -hmm. she modeled so beautifully. Right. So idea. the frustration is that she's got this selfish husband and I got this <laughs> yeah. selfless wife and that at times has created a lot of friction. Well, that's good. That's a beautiful picture okay. there. Well, we're 25 years in and yeah. we're making good strides, that's you right. know, and I think one of the reasons we're making strides and I would encourage anyone listening is goes back to love is a decision, but you also have to be very intentional. Mm -hmm. It takes intentionality. I don't think you're just going to naturally grow together. You know, when we used to teach marriage conferences, we were always we always told our people you're either growing 
closer in oneness or you're isolating. There's no in between. There's no yeah. riding the fence here. So as you're driving around, listen to this right now, ask yourself, am I growing closer to my spouse or am I isolating? Mm. And there's your answer of what you need to do. And one of the things you can do is just be super intentional. And some mm-hmm. practical things you can do is, you know, date your spouse, you know, serve them through setting up a romantic date. Yeah. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be fancy. It can be a walk in the park. It can be a picnic. It's true. I mean, little things go a long way, but really dating your spouse because that feeling may not always be there. But when you put effort into loving that person and doing things that, you know, they like, um, then I think that goes a long way. Yeah, Mm. definitely. Yeah. I mean, as far as, uh, you know, dating your spouse, I know that one thing for Jen and I, we just like road trips. It's just a nice loaded time where we can be in the car together. We can talk about, you know, kind of the last six months or eight months or the last month or whatever it was between the last time we took a road trip. And we just get a chance to kind of dream and think about the future and evaluate what's happened and, you know, all those. I think those are, yeah, again, in addition to date nights that we try to do, you know, every so often, once or twice a month, uh, depending on budget and time and stuff like that. So, so I, I want to spend our last uh, remaining minutes here talking to those who find themselves single, whether they mm-hmm. have found themselves single because they are went through a divorce, they're widowed, or maybe they're in that Gen Z category that we talked about at the beginning where they're 26, 27, 28, and they are putting off marriage. What would you say mm-hmm. as some advice to, to those people? You know, the, the truth is, is the gospel covers all of our sin. Yeah. And that's what's so great about having a savior. And so, um, you know, divorce is not like somebody, it's not like the scarlet letter, right? Like the D. And unfortunately, people who have been divorced may have felt that at times past oh, yeah. in the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, far cry though from today, we have literally, there's divorce parties that are thrown. Yeah. We shouldn't be celebrating a divorce. That 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 That's something to be grieved. Um, that's something that, um, that c- should break our hearts Mm -hmm. if there's divorce. Uh, The Bible, in the book of Malachi, God says, I hate divorce. Mm -hmm. But what he doesn't say is, I hate those who have been divorced. I think that's a good distinction. He hates divorce, the fact of what it causes. I mean, to the kids, to the family, to our witness in the community. Mm -hmm. But the good news is, is if somebody's been through a divorce, that doesn't mean God's finished with them. In fact, one thing I would encourage people to do is let that be part of your story. Yeah. Use that story to help people to be able to heal. Honey, what would you say to maybe those who are single as well, and they're just kind of feeling restless and anxious and, uh, you know, what yeah, would it look well, like to walk in that contentment? You know, I know it once you want to be married, right? You're wanting that person, your soulmate. And, and I would say, you know, work on yourself because mm-hmm. when you get married, you're following yourself into that marriage mm-hmm. <laughs> and you're bringing all your strengths and weaknesses to that. So while you are single, look at that as a gift of development because, Anytime you get married, there's going to be problems. And I always, when we do premarital counseling, we always say, realize that the person you're marrying is going to fail you. And Mm -hmm. we idealize it, right? We're thinking, oh, well, once I say I do, everything's going to be perfect. Oh, all of his flaws will go away. It's, you know, happily ever after. (laughs) They're going to be magnified. (laughs) And I think the church needs to do a better job of, you know, yes, it is a happily ever after, but let's focus on what after you say I do. Yeah. After you say I do, because what's happening is you're taking two imperfect people and you're, you know, yes, saying I do into a covenant to God, but you're still bring in your sin nature with you, and you're going to let each other down. You know, you just are. Totally. You're going to let each other down. So I always say, don't look to that person to fulfill you. Mm. And I think that I wish someone would have drilled that into my head because I think so often we're so in love, you know, we just can't wait. And then as soon as they let us down, we're like, what? How could this happen? Yeah. But, you know, when you keep your eyes on Jesus... And yes, you love your spouse. Yes, you have boundaries. Yes, you have expectations. But you don't look to that person to fulfill you Mm -hmm. and give you what only God can give you. Yeah, that's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there clearly the model is uh, Jesus loving the church for marriage, and it can be difficult. And I've appreciated that you guys have been honest in the good times <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, and honest about some of the struggles. And hopefully, our audience has been able to uh, to take some of those nuggets of truth and can apply them to their life, and that they can whatever whatever you have in the future as far as relationships and marriage, that you can cling first to Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. and that you can continue to work and sanctify. Um, what your life looks like in Jesus Christ and serve your spouse 
in the future. So with that, thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of The Unapologetic Show. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of The Unapologetic Show, where we seek to defend truth without compromise. If you're interested in checking out more unapologetic shows, you can do so by clicking the playlist here. If you are interested in credible answers to curious questions, one of the things that we do a lot here on this channel, feel free to subscribe. We have answered over a thousand questions. Hope to meet you next time on The Unapologetic Show.